Hello everyone, and welcome to the 98th episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Candyman from the Candyman series, a vengeful spirit created by the collective suffering of horribly wronged individuals. Candyman is a malevolent phantom who rips the lives of innocents to shreds so he might fuel his existence as an immortal phantasm, a specter of the past lurking in the shadows, waiting to unleash his fury on those who would dare to speak his name aloud. In this video, we'll be exploring all that were given about Candyman in the first film and the 2021 sequel of the same name, as well as some supporting information that can be found in the story that this film was partially adapted from, The Forbidden by Clive Barker. For cohesion's sake, and because the second and third films in this series leave much to be desired as far as providing anything of substance to the Candyman universe, I won't be using any information that can be found in either of those films. And although these films are rife with symbolism and metaphors relating to the struggles of the many unfortunate souls who were wronged by racial injustice on several different levels, this video is an analysis of Candyman himself, so I won't be delving into any of those themes here either, just so you're aware. Now without further ado, let's begin. The man who would start the legacy of horror, that is the Candyman, was named Daniel Robitail, the son of a former slave who made his fortune by designing a device that allowed for the mass production of shoes after the Civil War. Daniel was artistically gifted and he honed his craft through portraiture, eventually making a name for himself as a world-class artist in his field. In the 1890s, Daniel would travel the country painting portraits for all manner of wealthy individuals, and for a time, life was good for Daniel Robitaille. However, all that would change once he was commissioned to create a portrait of the daughter of a wealthy landowner, a man who wanted Daniel to capture her virginal beauty. Unfortunately for Daniel, this beauty was far too much for him to resist, and he fell in love with the young woman, deflowering her while her father was away. Upon discovering that she was pregnant, she went teary-eyed to her father and told him that she had been assaulted by Daniel in the most heinous way, a false admonition that sparked a fury in her father. So he sent a group of thugs to run Daniel down, and these men proceeded to beat Daniel within an inch of his life once they had found him, even going so far as to cut off his hand and jam a meat hook into the bloody stump. And to make matters worse, they stole all the honeycombs from a nearby apiary and slathered them over Daniel's naked body, after which they burned his corpse on a pyre upon the grounds that would later come to be known as Cabrini Green, a blaze which attracted a crowd of onlookers who stood gawking and cajoling at the desecrated corpse of Daniel Robitaille. But that would not be the end of Daniel, for injustice is often met with fury, and even from beyond the grave, the wrath of the wronged can extend to the corporeal world to plague both the innocent and criminal alike, and such is the case for Daniel Robitaille, who, so long as there were people who remembered his name, returned to eviscerate anyone who continued to tell his story. But therein lies the power of the returned Daniel Robitaille, memory, for if there were none left to speak his name, he would fade into obscurity, a brutal footnote in history reduced to nothing more than dust in the wind. But all it takes is one person to remember the name of Daniel Robitaille. And as time went on, and his power lessened, it seemed that the legend of the Revenant seeking vengeance from his bloody grave indeed faded into obscurity. However, in the 1920s, through happenstance or otherwise, a man by the name of William Bell was lynched for unknown reasons. A man who in some way invoked the name of Daniel Robitaille and allowed him to assimilate his form so he might continue satiating his bloodlust. This was the beginning of Candyman, the collective memory of individuals who were wronged by racial injustice. And from this time on, the cycle would continue in much the same way, starting again in the 1950s with Samuel Evans, who was ran down during the White Housing Riots, and then again in the 1970s when Sherman Fields, a homeless man with a hook for a hand who liked to give candy to children in the Cabrini Green neighborhood, who was beaten to death by the police after a young white girl found a piece of candy in her Halloween stash that contained a razor blade. Of course, Sherman was later found innocent, but the damage had been done, and the collective spirit of vengeance that would now come to be known as the Candyman by virtue of Sherman's kind-hearted acts was given new life, a legend that was once again suppressed by the actions of Helen Lyle when she, the reincarnation of Daniel Robitaille's lover, refused to give in to his desire to have her link with him for eternity by living as a legend with him, severing her connection to him by saving a young Anthony McCoy, the child who would grow into the man that would become the next iteration of Candyman with the help of William Burke. Now, as you can tell, 
The common theme here, in all of these scenarios, is racial injustice committed against an individual. And though a desire to exact revenge against those who have wronged him might initially appear to be the reason why Candyman keeps returning from the dead, the real reason for his continued manifestation across time is far more sinister. As explained by Candyman himself in the first film, his power lies in his continued existence in the collective public consciousness, his congregation, as he calls it. I am the writing on the wall, the whisper in the classroom. Without these things, I am nothing. So says the Candyman. It's interesting to note that the phrase, sweets for the sweet, which appears numerous times throughout both films, is never really given a meaning. However, it is given one in the short story that inspired these films, The Forbidden. The sweetness he offered was life without living, was to be dead but remembered everywhere, immortal in gossip and graffiti. And this definition for this phrase provides even more support for the idea that the Candyman's one desire is to simply continue on with his immortal existence at the expense of others. A selfish being, molded by pure malice, who has long since given up his desire to exact revenge against those who wronged him. In the beginning of his existence, I imagine that Daniel Robitaille's purpose upon his resurrection was to exact revenge against those who had wronged him. However, as the Candyman states himself, once his mythos has been put into question, he must shed innocent blood in order to sustain his ethereal existence. And in both of these films, the large majority of murders that we can attribute to Candyman are committed against innocent people. They will say that I have shed innocent blood. What's blood for, if not for shedding? With my hook for a hand, I'll split you from your groin to your gullet. So says the Candyman. Clara and Billy, Ruthie Jean, the mentally disabled boy castrated in the public restroom, Bernadette, Dr. Burke, Helen Lyle, Clive Privler, Jerrica Cooper, Finley Stevens, Annika, Samantha, Celine, and Danielle, Anthony McCoy, and long ago, the sisters of William Burke. All these lives were either ended or otherwise severely impacted by the malicious intent of Candyman, and each and every one of them dared to commit but a single crime, entertaining the legend that is Candyman. The only murders we ever see Candyman commit against the guilty are the ones committed against the cops at the end of the second film. So while we can without a doubt claim that the men who lost their lives due to racial injustice were wronged in some of the most heinous ways imaginable, we can't say that the hive mind that would eventually become Candyman is a spirit that kills in order to bring justice to those deserving to be punished for their crimes. Far from it, in fact. What do the good know except what the bad teach them? by their excesses, so says the Candyman. This line might indicate that Candyman is punishing the good in general for their excesses, but this line could still be taken as Candyman justifying his wanton expressions of violence by reasoning that it provides the good with lessons in fear and humility in the face of his all-consuming cruelty. So when it comes down to it, who is Candyman? He's a wraith that was created by numerous injustices committed against innocent men for the crime of simply being born with black skin. The lingering malice of those wronged by some of the worst kind of criminals that exist in human society. However, upon his ascension to a supernatural form, this hive mind realized that it was now effectively immortal, eternal life that would remain eternal so long as there were people left to tell the tale of the many unfortunate souls who make up the Candyman. The story of the Candyman is ultimately an expression of a concept that has proven to be the cause of an untold amount of misery in this world, that being that evil inevitably breeds more evil. And as long as there are those who would defile innocence in the way these men were defiled, there will always be a Candyman in one form or another. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on Candyman? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you liked this video, hit that thumbs up button and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, my patrons, and anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank, a most vile thank you to them, as well as our most dedicated patrons. Join the channel's Discord server and Reddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.